one. Hello, I'm Thomas Hicks, uh, Commissioner at the United States Election Assistance Commission. And this is the second in a panel discussion on uh, helping those who have disabilities with um, accessibility to the polls during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is very timely. This is something that we need to discuss more of. Um, the last panel that we, the first panel that we had uh, was very informative and we decided that we needed to have more voices into the process. And so um, we've taken the um, unusual step that if we were in Washington, we probably would not be able to uh, have our friends from Hawaii join on this, but being a part of the United States, they deserve to have a voice too in this process and some of the things that they're working on for their constituencies. So we decided that we were gonna invite Hawaii as well. So thank you uh, everyone for being a part of this. So please tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what you've been working on lately in terms of regarding up to the uh, upcoming election. And Tina, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, my name is Tina Barton. I'm the city clerk for the city of Rochester Hills, Michigan. And uh, basically what I'm working on is processing record number um, AV applications in the state of Michigan. So uh, very busy with our election here. We have already surpassed uh, our November 2016 presidential numbers and we had done that by July 1st. So we are again breaking records here in the state of Michigan with absentee uh, ballot turnout and that's got a lot of my attention right now. <laughs> Great. Michelle, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for having me uh, this afternoon. My name is Michelle Bishop, and I'm the Voting Rights Specialist with an organization called NDRN, the National Disability Rights Network. We are really focused all the time on making sure that voting is accessible for voters with disabilities. And in 2020, in the context of a global pandemic, that means a lot of things. <laughs> we already heard about probably the biggest issue right now is that record absentee and vote by mail uh, requests. And we're working on making sure that vote by mail processes are going to be accessible to people with disabilities that are not currently fully accessible, but also making sure that folks who need it are still going to have an option to vote in person for those voters for whom vote by mail just may not work, as well as probably the last issue we're really taking a look at is making sure that as our elections officials are sort of forced to make some last minute changes to how they run their elections, that they're letting voters know what those changes are and that they're using accessible modes to make sure voters know what's coming. Great. Clark, would you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit of what, what, what you're working on right now for the upcoming election? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Hicks, and thank you to the Election Assistance Commission for bringing us all together here today. My name is Clark Rockfall. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Governmental Affairs for the American Council of the Blind, or ACB. And we are a national consumer membership organization with the mission to increase the security, independence, economic opportunity, and quality of life uh, for people who are blind and visually impaired. So ACB is comprised of state and special interest affiliates, about 70 in total, again, across the entire nation. And when it comes to voting, we're really focused on the, the independence and the, the equal opportunity aspects of our mission. So we really wanna make sure that our members uh, have equal access to the entire voting process. That's access to information, voter registration, in-person polling, as well as accessible remote absentee voting. Uh, so not only are we trying to make the, put those policies in place, but we also want to communicate that to our members and make sure everyone knows what's available to them uh, as the state election boards implement those systems and practices. Great, thank you. And now from the state of Hawaii, Anthony Arkemine and Kristen Wida, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you're working on um, and some of the things that you are planning for the upcoming election? Yes. My name is Anthony Akmini. Um, I'm a part of voter services section and what our area that we do is we provide education and outreach and normally we're 
um, out in the community and um, with COVID-19, we're trying to do a lot more different types of um, outreaches utilizing Zoom, um, Facebook Live and all different other kind of um, partnering mechanism. And I have yeah. Kristen here. Oh, yeah, okay. So I'm Kristen Ueda with um, Office of Elections here in the state of Hawaii. Um, and then I'm, we um, transition, trans, um, sorry. <laughs> this election is the first election that we'll be conducting everything by mail. So the legislature passed the bill in 2019. So before the whole COVID thing happened. So we got a head start with the process of being able to transition um, and prepare those ballot packets to be mailed out. So we're in the middle of that right now. Um, our primary election is on August 8th. So it's coming up soon. So we're yeah in the middle of getting those ballot processes to be mailed. Great, great, great. So I want to jump into our, our first set of questions. Um, it, you know, I, I figure that this is something that everyone can answer. Uh, please share your top concerns towards some of the barriers to accessible voting created by COVID-19. I can go first if you would like. Please do. <laughs> um, so for me, one of the concerns that I have is that uh, any any precinct that was located in any type of, of an assisted living facility, whether it be for those um, who are aging or those who just need assistance, which we have both in our community. Um, so the, uh, an apartment, it's set up like an apartment type complex and those with disabilities all, all live there um, and, and get special assistance. So they don't necessarily have to be seniors to be there. Um, but any of those types of facilities basically asked us to remove our precincts. Um, and some of those, we contacted them, you know, to say, are you going to be comfortable with us bringing the public into your facility on election day? So a concern I have as a clerk is I'm removing the most accessible thing they have, and that's them walking down the stairs or them, you know, coming down to the precinct, however they get there, um, and, and not being able to just do that in their own building, which they're used to doing. And that concerns me that I'm removing that convenience for them. And now it basically, if they don't have uh, transportation through their facility, through a family member or friend, um, that I might, it might discourage someone from voting. And, and that bothers me of how do I get that information out to them to make sure that they understand, they know, um, how they can still vote, what our options are, what their options are with the city um, uh, for voting as far as transportation or things like that. So that is one of the things that's a big concern for me is we're removing the convenience for some of these voters by being able to vote in their facility because we had to do it due to COVID of not wanting to bring the public into the facility. Anyone else? Yeah, this is Michelle. I think that that makes a lot of sense. We're really concerned that we're losing some of our more accessible polling places, not just for the voters who live in some of those facilities, but for voters who might be coming from anywhere for whom that was an accessible location to vote. And, it, and it's true, we have to, right? The residential facilities have an obligation to protect their residents from COVID-19. They can't necessarily open the floodgates uh, to voters and what's expected to be an extremely high turnout election. So we understand why some of these polling locations are going away, but I, thinking about what we're gonna do about that, how we're gonna make sure those voters are able to vote. And some of the other programs that typically exist in addition to using those types of polling locations, jurisdictions that go into residential facilities to assist people who live there to be able to vote, going into hospitals for people who experience emergency hospitalization after absentee deadlines have passed so that they're able to cast their ballots if they're eligible voters. How are we gonna do that in a context of a pandemic where visitors aren't allowed into any of those locations? And there are not necessarily easy solutions to a lot of these problems. This is Clark with ACB. Just to add on uh, to what the previous two panelists have said, it, I think it's totally natural with the, the coronavirus for everyone initial or intuitive reaction is to pull back, right? Um, but when, when we're doing that, we're not only seeing that with regards to polling locations and in-person voting, um, consolidating the number of polling locations, 
But we're also seeing that with transportation as well. So if somebody does plan to vote in person and they rely on public transit or rides from third party, uh, whether it's private companies uh, or friends and family, you might be less inclined to trust uh, that your safety is front of mind when relying on those sources. Um, or the services just might not be available or they might be scaled back so much that it's uh, a tremendous burden to make it to a polling place that might not be your original polling place. It very well could be one that's new to you and in a less convenient uh, part of town or location. So that's certainly a concern for in-person voting. And then with the, the dramatic shift that we're seeing towards absentee and remote absentee voting, vote by mail with a paper ballot, uh, the, the biggest concern that ACB and our members have is will there be an accessible option to casting a paper ballot and needing to vote by mail? Hi, this is Anthony. Um, I, I wanted to share uh, one of the things that's a concern is with COVID-19, you know, the need to social distance, stay at home, shelter at, in place. You, you find many individuals, you know, definitely like um, Clark was sharing uh, about transportation needs and concerns. But with one of the things that um, Hawaii has been fortunately ahead of the curve is that we're, we've been um, planning to transition to election by mail for over a year. And um, one of the things is that all eligible, properly registered voters will be receiving their ballot packet you know, in the mail 18 days prior to the election. In addition, there'll be other um, accessible voting options, including voter service centers. Okay. Great. So we can move on to question number two. Um, election officials are working tirelessly across the United States to address accessible needs, but solutions are not a one size fits all. Discuss a best practice is the potential to assist voters with the dis with disabilities during the coronavirus crisis. Anyone want to start? Sure. So we have here in the, the city of Rochester Hills, uh, we have an ADA device that is set up here right at City Hall. So if they choose to vote the absentee process, uh, it still allows them opportunity to vote a secret ballot. Uh, with the touch rider that we have. We use heart equipment here uh, in Oakland County and they can still vote a ballot even though they're doing it by absentee, they can vote it secretly. Um, I know uh, one thing that was kind of revolutionary for me, I guess, um, as someone who hadn't really thought about this, my massage therapist is actually uh, blind and he told me that although he's been married a really long time and trusts his wife, you know, he said something to me that just really was profound and so simple, but just probably hadn't really thought about is that I always have to trust that that person is doing what I asked them to do. And since it's his wife, he said, I trust her. But at the same time, I never get affirmation that my ballot was actually cast as I 100% wanted it to be. And so I, I want voters to know that they have that opportunity and that option here at City Hall to get the absentee ballot. That being said, I have never had someone call City Hall and, and that said that I cannot get to the precinct and I cannot get to uh, get an absentee ballot by absentee that we have not gone to them. I have a practice of doing that. If someone calls us, even if they're elderly, if they're disabled, and they say, I have no way of getting this, and I know that they're not going to get their absentee ballot returned to us if I trust the mail system, I will go to them with a team, and we will go straight to their house, and we will provide the ballot to them. We will wait while they vote, or if they need our assistance, we will assist them in the process, and then we will bring the ballot back. But I never leave there until they've had their opportunity to vote. I've done the same in hospitals, and that is our practice here. We will go to the voter if they can't get to us. I think this is Michelle. I think another important best practice that we should leverage here is the idea of curbside voting. 
Curbside voting right now is a really important stopgap measure that we use when polling places aren't fully compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that if your polling place isn't accessible to you and you can't get inside, if you can get to the curb, <laughs> they will bring a ballot out to you so that you can still vote. Um, now that doesn't to get you off the hook for making your polling places fully accessible, but it is something we use to make sure that people are still able to vote until we achieve full compliance with the ADA. But every day when I watch the news and I see COVID-19 testing facilities, they're drive up. And there's a reason for that. They're trying to limit exposure, limit exposure for the people who are providing the test and limit exposure for anyone who's in the vehicle who maybe isn't going to test positive and doesn't really need to be exposed today when they show up to get tested. There are a significant number of people with disabilities who are immunosuppressed for whom exposure to COVID-19 is incredibly dangerous. There are people who are at increased risk for complications related to COVID-19, where the single most important factor for them may be limiting that exposure. And if voting by mail is not accessible to them, or if we've seen in some states their ballot doesn't arrive in time, they have to make a decision, am I gonna vote or am I gonna protect my health? And I think curbside voting can become another important stopgap measure in addition to going inside and voting the traditional way in a polling place to make sure that people who really need to can limit their exposure if we're leveraging it everywhere because curbside voting is traditionally a matter of state law and it's not in use in every state. And this is Clark with ACB. The previous two panelists outlined uh, exactly why we need a, a full catalog and selection of accessible voting options, right? Whether that's accessible ballot marking devices that folks may travel to or jurisdictions being able to bring those devices to individuals, uh, whether that's curbside voting, which is great for someone who's immune suppressed or has you know, maybe physical impairments that might impede them um, from successfully navigating in the voting facility, but they can do so effectively from their car, but that might not work well for someone who's blind uh, so we really need to make sure that the in-person polling locations still have adequate staff levels and staff that's trained um, to al allow somebody who's blind or visually impaired to have equal access to that accessible ballot marking device. That doesn't mean that curbside voting shouldn't be allowed. Uh, it's just what works for some may not work for others. And we need to make sure that folks have access to the, the voting option that could best suit their needs. Uh, and then in the case where folks may not want to vote in person, we still need to ensure that remote absentee voting is accessible as well. So for some folks, uh, voting by mail with a paper ballot is a great option. For other individuals, they may need to receive that ballot electronically in an accessible format where they can privately and independently mark, cast, and then absolutely verify their own ballot so that their vote is cast appropriately. And then whether for their ability, they can print it out, fold it, sign it, and mail it back in, or if their disability prevents that, having the option to be able to fax or email and electronically return that ballot as well. Anthony, would you like to comment on that? Well, on one question? of the things that I came to mind was to um, really put consumers with disabilities in mind throughout the election process. For example, as Hawaii transitioned to um, election by mail, we, we, we looked at all different areas, including our website. As we moved to um, voting by mail, we looked to make sure that our links were accessible, including a lot more videos for um, to assist them, voters who are hard to reach. Utilizing Facebook Live. Um, in addition, um, knowing that you have consumers that may still want that option to vote at a voter service center. We, we included voter service centers which are available at familiar locations and at familiar yeah. times. The other thing that, that we're very excited about is that um, this, this year, voters with special needs will have the opportunity to utilize an alternate format ballot, which means basically that 
an individual with special needs will be able to request for an alternate format ballot, HTML. They'll be able to um, access that ballot and vote from the convenience of their own home utilizing their own assistive technology. What sort of place uh, safeguards are in place for that? Because I know that some of the folks will have a little bit of issue with electronic return. So I'm sure that you have safeguards already in place for that. Yeah, well, um, so the HTML ballot is, um, when voters request for it, it'll, the HTML file is emailed to um, the voter with a secrecy waiver. Um, they can go ahead and take that file, put it on their computer, and they're able to utilize that HTML ballot ballot offline, so they don't need to be connected to the internet. Um, they'll go ahead and vote the ballot, and then they can, they'll print out a paper summary page that they'll be able to review their votes for cast properly. Um, they can either mail, fax, or scan and email that summary page with the secrecy waiver back to the county elections division, where they'll go ahead and verify the signature and go process um, the HTML summary page back. So, Thank you. Uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Um, Want to move on to question number three? Um, while some, and this is, we're right in this topic already. While some question the return of marked ballots, there are more, there is more acceptance, acceptability of electronic ballot delivery. How can electronic ballot delivery benefit voters with disabilities? One of the things that I, I want to Hawaii, you want to start? <laughs> Let's say Hawaii, do you want to start? Yes. So one of the things about um, an alternate format ballot, it provides a voter with special needs, non-visual access to the ballot information. For example, um, a voter that's blind may, may, may utilize their own assistive technology to have the ballot information read to them. They'll be able to mark their ballot. And that's really good in terms of privacy and independence. Right. I, th I think also too that, um, um, I'm sorry, Michelle. <laughs> I think also too that um, the electronic um, ballot delivery also removes some barriers that may seem uh, simple but can also um, become an issue something as simple as postage the printing internet access um, you know uh, so we we have to look at, at all of those things too that um, uh, can be barriers in, in some way that uh, but also having their ability to return that electronically would help alleviate the need for them to again get postage, put that in the mail, have some, you know, someone print that out or they print it out. So they still have to, you know, still have to go through the print process, which can be cumbersome. And so I think that that helps uh, alleviate those steps. And I, I would just add to that, that I think voters with disabilities, we sometimes get caught in this weird catch 22 where when we talk about in-person voting being inaccessible, people say, well, they can vote absentee. And when we talk about vote by mail being inaccessible, they say, well, they can vote in person. Well, the truth is neither of those are actually fully accessible. Neither works for every single type of voter. And that's actually pretty difficult to achieve because there are so many different types of disabilities. They're all very different. They come with different access needs. No two people who have the same disability even experience it the same way. And, and every voter is different. Not just voters with disabilities, every voter is different. And something different works for them. So really we have an obligation to make sure that every method that we're offering to voters is as accessible as we can possibly make it. Our in-person offerings and our vote by mail offerings. And to be honest, the ADA really requires that of us. Vote by mail, I think, has been largely flying under the radar. And COVID-19, if anything, has really highlighted the fact that there are a lot of states that haven't done anything to make their vote by mail processes more accessible. Mailing someone a piece of paper and expecting them to mark it by hand is a violation of federal law if 
Clark goes to a polling place and he can't mm -hmm. see and mark that ballot independently, Clark doesn't magically regain his vision when he goes home unless there's something I don't know about Clark. So he can't <laughs> sit at his kitchen table either. Uh, Michelle and the other panelists all make excellent points. Uh, I agree with everything I've heard. And just to reiterate, uh, Anthony and the folks in Hawaii, thank you all for uh, double checking that your voter registration website is accessible. Uh, another thing that's already required by law. Uh, and for the folks who are working in the polling places to have those accessible ballot marking devices up and running, again, already required by the Help America Vote Act. And really, like Michelle said, Title II of the ADA covers all aspects of uh, the, the voting process. So especially as states expand to no excuse absentee voting, we've already seen in NFB versus Lamone in the state of Maryland in the Fourth Circuit, that absentee voting itself is considered a program that must be made accessible to comply with the ADA. So as, again, as much as we can have uh, a full catalog and menu of available options for voters to choose the one that best suits their needs and how they would like to vote, and if that is remote or vote by mail, uh, that must be accessible all the way through the process. And the, the beauty of electronic vote by mail or receiving the ballot electronically, being able to complete it, voters are using their own assistive technology um, you know, for those who have it in, in most cases. Again, it's, it's not a one size fits all solution, but it really does meet people where they are you get to use the accessible and assistive technology that you know and you're familiar with. So you're not stuck once every two or four years relearning a system uh, before you leave and come back in another two or four years. It's the, it's the same technology you use every day. You're comfortable with it and you're familiar with it. So as much as we can make that available to voters, I think the more people we will have engaged in the democratic process. Great point, great, great point. So I think everyone's answered that. We can move on to question number four, correct? What challenges are you hearing about for in-person voting accessibility during the COVID-19 crisis? Anyone can jump in. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and jump in. <laughs> um, so I, I think two of the things I'm hearing are, um, across the country, not just, you know, here locally, but, you know, less precincts being open. So maybe someplace that is close to you is no longer open and you're having to um, drive, go further than you've had to go. And maybe that means that you're doing a couple bus stops when you, you could only do one, you know, prior now it's like multiple, multiple stops to get to where you need to go. And so transportation uh, becomes an issue when uh, the precincts start consolidating, the locations start consolidating. Um, and I know for here, uh, us locally in Rochester Hills, we don't have public transportation. We don't have a, a public busing system that goes through, you know, all of our, our streets and roads and picks up. Um, we do have what's called an OPC, an Older Persons Commission, um, that has a bus that people use uh, here in our city, but our OPC is closed down right now. And actually, since we've been on this call, I've written myself a note that I need to confirm of whether they're gonna offer transportation on election day or not, um, because that is a concern for me, the transportation and consolidation of polling locations. Yeah, this is Michelle. I can say we worry about there being enough polling locations and polling locations being large enough, not just to handle the number of voters we can potentially anticipate, but to socially distance them. Uh, we also talk a lot about the CDC guidelines for polling places and having enough PPE. We don't even always have enough PPE for our healthcare workers, but our elections personnel need to have PPE. And quite frankly, if we're going to expect voters to wear masks, we need to be able to provide them. Sending me home from the grocery store because I don't have a mask doesn't mean I don't get to eat. I can come back to the grocery store any other day, 365 days out of the year. Voting, I get one chance. You can't send me away. If we're going to expect it, we need to be able to provide it the same way we provide everything else you need to be able to vote. We need to have enough PPE to provide to our personnel and to our voters. For Hawaii, um, this is Anthony. 
one of the concerns that brings to mind is, you know, with COVID-19, the need to social distance, um, continue to sanitize um, the um, facilities. Um, with um, Hawaii uh, we're, and our transition to election by mail, we, we, we utilizing voter service centers. And w when we factored in the decisions, we looked at familiar locations that voters are uh, familiar with. For example, we're, we're utilizing um, the same in-person early walk in locations that was utilized in past elections. So voter may vote 10 days prior to election through election day. And this is Clark. Uh, one of the things that we hear is just the, basically the fear of the unknown, right? So if the election system is changing um, it sounds like they're doing a great job in Hawaii and Tina's doing an amazing job as well. Uh, all election bureaus and jurisdictions should be communicating that in effective ways to, uh, to meet voters with a disability uh, and really get that message out to them so they know their polling location, they know what their options are um, for how to vote. Another thing we're hearing, as already discussed, uh, transportation. Uh, what transportation options will be available? Uh, how long will it take? What are, and basically, what are the options? And then finally, in the polling location, as Michelle touched on, the, the access to uh, you know, personal protective equipment, being able to remain socially distant, wondering if the polling locations have been consolidated to a point that you know, just down the road from me here in Alexandria, Virginia, Washington, DC, Folks were waiting for more than five hours in line. And if you're somebody who's blind or visually impaired and you're waiting in line, are you remaining socially distant from those around you? So that's just some of the concerns that we're hearing about here at, at the American Council of the Blind. You know, one other thing I can add to that too before we move on is that we've learned a lot about COVID-19 since this started. This really was becoming an issue right around the time of Super Tuesday back in March. And that was scary. We didn't know very much about this disease at the time. We've learned a lot since then as we're coming to the tail end of the primaries and we're getting gearing up for November. And one of the things we've learned is that really the primary mode of transmission for COVID-19 is that person-to-person -person contact. Uh, the FDA will tell you you're not going to get it from your groceries. Uh, they say you won't get it from getting your Amazon packages delivered, whatever it may be. So when we talk about going into polling places, interacting with your poll book, your voting equipment, there's, there's not a concern there. I've heard it floated as a concern, and there's really no science to support the idea that using a ballot marking device is a threat. Uh, if they say you're getting it from person to person contact, not from come from touching things, uh, then I think it's possible to make it safe. Quite frankly, if you are sanitizing and washing your hands, you really shouldn't have any concern about that. Probably the only person I'd be concerned about getting COVID from a ballot marking device is someone who votes and then washes their hands by licking them clean. That probably doesn't sound like it's it's particularly advisable, right? But so long as you're you're taking regular reasonable precautions, you're showing up to a polling place with your mask on, you're washing your hands on your way out, sanitizing your hands on the way out, then I think it's quite possible for us to make it safe. I think that um, e even if there isn't science maybe behind it, there um, is a uh, fear behind that and we have to recognize that. And so in our precincts, uh, we have face shields, we have face masks, we have gloves uh, for all of the, the workers. We have um, sanitation stations as they um, go to leave if they want where they can um, get some hand sanitizer. We also will um, close down in polling booths based on if they were just used, we're going to rotate them out. Uh, the design will be up, this um, polling, this privacy booth is closed for cleaning. So we'll have extra privacy booths set up so that as we rotate, them and, and clean them, uh, making sure that voters know that we're taking every precaution. Additionally, for our ADA device, our, our ballot marking device, the TouchWriter, we have purchased um, individual styluses um, through Heart. 
um, that they can, once they use it, they can actually just throw it away so they're not touching uh, the screen and a bunch of people touching the touch writer. Um, just to kind of, whether or not we think there's go could be transmission, to calm the fears of those who uh, maybe, uh, again, may might have immune disorders or um, even just uh, afraid of, of catching it because they're high risk. So we're taking lots of precautions in the precincts. I have done voter educational videos um, so that the voters can know what to expect when they get to the precinct and what precautions we're taking to help calm any fears they might have about coming to the precinct to vote. Yeah, I agree completely. I think anything that's related to person to person contact, right? The the face shields or those plastic guards you can put up. Uh, I think there is a lot of science to support the benefits of those masks, shields, those types of things. I think the sanitizing in between makes sense, right? <laughs> I mean, I think we all want to touch sanitary surfaces to the greatest extent possible. That having sanitizer available supports the the idea that one of our best lines of defense is is constantly sanitizing and washing your hands to stay clean. I think all that makes sense. I think the notion that how you vote when you get to your polling place makes some sort of difference in your COVID-19 exposure, in my mind, is a little misguided. So I absolutely want to see, I think that's amazing, Tina, and I want to see all of our elections officials taking all of those precautions. What I don't want to see is misinformation, uh, that somehow using one method of voting increases your level of risk. And this is Clark, just to add on to what Tina and Michelle have expertly stated, the, the CDC has updated guidance for uh, voting safety during COVID-19. And as, as much as possible, that's a great resource and voting precincts should implement those, those best practices. And of course, practice good hygiene and have PPE available. Uh, but again, as long as in-person voting is an option that must be made accessible. And if that involves using an you know, accessible ballot marking device, then it shouldn't be an option of taking away a machine because multiple people will be using it, rather to find ways to make that safer so that the people who need that equipment may still use that equipment. I also do like your idea, Tina, of um, closing voting stations for cleaning, because if you do that every other voting station, that's probably going to seriously help with your social distancing, too. I think that's smart. Thank you. I also give a plug to the EAC. They have guidelines out on their website, too, to, to help um, precincts <laughs> and, and what you can do. So I'll give you a little attaboy, Tom. Good job. <laughs> I was just about to say that. <laughs> I wanted to share um, one thought that um, Clark was, was sharing about how transportation may be a, a barrier. Um, one thought that came to mind was that um, preparing, you know, planning ahead for um, voters. I, I really encourage voters to, you know, check their um, elections websites, you know, check with their families. If they're considering um, going to a voter service center and transportation may be a a concern, check with um, their friends or family to see if they might be going to a voter service center. And, um, you know, consider rideshare options such as Uber or you know, Lyft and, you know, other types of things. So, you know, just biggest thing is preparing. Excellent. Uh, I guess we can move on to the next question. Uh, given the increased likelihood uh, in the number of decrease in polling places this fall, how might transportation obstacles for persons with disabilities be addressed? And we kind of covered that just now. <laughs> so, but if anyone else, anything else to add, um, I would add that um, uh, rideshare apps uh, in the past have uh, donated a ton of free rides to, for people uh, to get to the polling places. Uh, I don't know what their policy will be this time around, uh, but I do know that they have put into place uh, several ways to um, protect yourself in the rides, um, which works now in the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere <laughs> sort of thing, uh, where they say wear a mask and open the windows, but I don't know how well that will work come November. Or so, but um, I think that you know. Hopefully, by that time, we'll have other aspects in place to uh, help protect folks who are using rideshare um, services. But does anyone else have anything else to add 
for that. I would just say this is a great opportunity to reach out to your community for corporate sponsors. If they like to um, do community service that maybe they can't do in person community service in groups like they would traditionally would bring, you know, 20 or 30 people out to, to do plant help with your garden or, or something like that, that this might be a way that their, um, you know, corporate sponsorships or corporate involvement um, to help those who need rideshare opportunities be able to get to the precincts. I would say too, you know, if rideshare companies can offer free rides to the polls, so can public transit systems where they do exist should be offering free transit for you to be able to get to and from the polls. And it can't be stated enough, electronic delivery and return of ballots alleviate the need for finding a ride to the polls on election day. People with disabilities shouldn't be the only people who have to find a way to get to the polls. Well, non-disabled voters get to stay home and stay safe. We need to make our vote by mail accessible. Anyone else? Then we can move on to the last question. Please share your thoughts on advancing future technological solutions and re research and development initiatives to assist voters with disabilities. All encompassing. Yeah, okay. so this is Clark. I'd like to go on record as for research and development. <laughs> and at, as much as possible, I, I think we need to look at ways to make voting more accessible, whether that's in person, but then also as much of the country, even outside of COVID-19, was already trending towards vote by mail. Um, in some cases, you know, fully statewide vote by mail and absentee voting systems. We should really be looking at ways to make those systems more accessible, uh, more secure for the individuals as well as the integrity of the voting system as a whole. But that would really drive voter turnout and make sure the will of the people are heard, especially voters with disabilities who haven't had access previously. Um, I can say that um, I also think research and development funding is critical. There, This is not a big money industry, developing voting tech. You have a limited customer base. If I were someone who developed technology, I'd probably make a lot more money developing a smartphone than a voting system because you have way more customers. We need to have our government invest in developing better solutions. They should be investing in research and development funding to make all of our voting systems more accessible. And I think it's time to focus on how we are going to make full electronic marking, full electronic delivery marking and return of ballots a widespread reality. Rather than arguing about it, we could be investing in making it a solution. Sorry. I will go on record and say that I am for uh, research and development and, and technological solutions, not name Skynet. So. Okay. Research and development is really good. Um, that really helps to um, identify things for the future. And um, one of the things is um, constantly um, including people with um, across the disability sector in, in identifying um, barriers. I can second opposition to Skynet. 2020 has enough problems without <laughs> Skynet going live. We have murder hornets, guys. We can have I, I would just say, you know, from a local clerk's perspective, um, obviously I am 100% for this. You know, I, I think that this is a very complex problem. I think that we can still maintain the integrity of the process. I've always been a big proponent of paper ballots, how that is, however, it's not the solution for all. And I recognize that too. And so we have to uh, be open-minded as much as we want to be inclusive um, for all voters and for all um, abilities and to be able to, to vote and to do it like any other voter can. We're just starting to do the accessible absent voter um, ballot application here in Michigan and looking for um, that to move forward for the November election. If there is research and development, I'm always the first clerk to raise my hand and say, I'll be your guinea pig, I'll work with you, let's see how we make this process work. <laughs> because there are a lot of, a lot of groups that bring 
people to the table, but they forget to include the person that has practical application and um, who would actually see the process from start to finish um, for the voter. So um, I'm raising my hand right now. If there's a group out there and you're, you're wanting to try something, wanting to do something, let's work together to see how we can make voting more accessible for all and maintain the integrity of the process during it. Great, great, great. great. Shout, out to election officials. Shout out to elections officials who are willing to be the guinea pig or to innovate. You all are keeping this industry alive. We need that. Pilot programs. We don't necessarily need to call you a guinea pig. Set up pilot programs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, just to add on to what Tina and Anthony said is I think incorporating the election officials to get that real mm -hmm. world feel feedback uh, and in, in doing that early on in the process. And then I'll also add, like Anthony said, listening to voters with disabilities and including them in the process as well. A lot of times accessibility is considered basically as the product or after the product has gone to market. And sometimes when that feedback is received, they're like, oh, well, that's, that's good to know. Yeah, but we'll address that in the future. You know, the product's already done now. So as much as possible, uh, if election vendors and election officials can work with people with disabilities, receive that feedback up front and early on in the process so that if there are changes that need to be made that can be implemented up front and not after uh, everything is all said and done. It's much more efficient and effective to consider accessibility and usability from the beginning than it is to retrofit after the fact. Great. Anyone else want to um, have any final thoughts before we close? No one? I'm hearing none? I want to thank you all for a very well-informed uh, panel discussion. I think that we touched on a lot of different subjects. I think that um, I learned a lot myself today. Um, one being that this year will mark 30 years since the ADA was signed into law, and we need to continue on with that. And it marks 20 years since we start, first started debating what became the Help America Vote Act after the 2000 election. So with those two monumental pieces of legislation, which really touched on allowing people who have disabilities to vote independently and privately, we need to move forward with that. And I wanna thank the folks out in Hawaii for getting up early to be a part of this, and also for teaching me something else uh, that we don't necessarily have to say uh, people with disabilities, we can say people who have special needs, because if we all live long enough, we will all have some special need to be taken care of. So um, in the realm of COVID-19, we've all felt that this has touched us all. And I think that come November, um, we all are in this together. And so, you know, hopefully we will all stay in this together so that we can have a successful run at our elections process. And with that, I want to thank my um, EAC colleagues for helping put this together, uh, the second of our, our, our forums here, and hopefully we'll be able to put this up soon and um, get this out to as many people as possible. So thank you all, and um, I hope to talk to you all really, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank, thank you so much. Stay safe. Stay safe.